for the past uh, few classes we have been talking about membranes, how to separate dissolved uh, salts, ions, biomolecules using different types of membranes and uh, we will continue in this class on further on membranes. If you look at uh, the membranes, you have membrane processes like uh, microfiltration, ultrafiltration, nanofiltration, reverse osmosis, dialysis, electrodialysis and so on actually. Each one has different types of membranes, you have hydrophilic membranes, you have hydrophobic membranes, it is used for separating practically a large number of varied components. We did talk about microfiltration some time back. Mm, let me again recap on that. It resembles like a conventional filtration. Okay. So, there are small pores in the membrane material. So, the solids which are very small then the pores will go through and the remaining solids will get filtered out. So, it is almost like a normal filtration process. So, because there are pores the pressure required is also much less, you use 1 to 2 bar, it is almost like the normal filtration where we also use 2 or 3 or 5 bar pressure, we do not go very high in pressure. Uh, but uh, the disadvantages of microfiltration are just like your normal filtration, there is going to be deposition of solids, frequent fouling of membrane. Fouling, I did mention about uh, fouling last time, fouling could be bacterial or biological in nature or it could be because of uh, the uh, polarization that is concentration polarization effects and so on actually. So, um, microfiltrations do come across this problem, both the fouling as well as the deposition of solids. So, build up of solids on the membrane, how do you minimize it? We can have a uh, depth filters upstream or a normal conventional filter upstream. So, it will capture all bigger particles and then you go to the microfiltration and then you resort to further filtration. Another disadvantage of microfiltration because the pressures are not very high, uh, you are going to get a concentrated slurry, you will not get dry solids after filtration. Ideally you would like to have a dry cake after filtration because uh, the storage or disposal becomes easy, whereas if it is a slurry it may contain about 10, 15, 20 percent water, so then it is not very a nice idea to store it, where will you store because of 20 percent water. So, membranes will lead you into slurry system and you cannot apply very high pressures because membrane will mechanically get damaged. So, that is the disadvantage of that. So, what do we do? Once you do this type of membrane filtration and you want to get, get, get rid of the concentrated slurry, sometimes uh, um, companies will resort to um, solar drying, that means uh, they will have open space and uh, maybe they will have a, a long uh, plastic surfaces on which the slurry is put in and uh, water will get dried because of the heating and uh, the solids which you get, you collect it and use it for either further processing or uh, disposal or landfill or animal feed, whatever you think of. So, the, you need to resort to this type of uh, um, the solar heating. Um, the equation, this is standard uh, equation for the flux, you have uh, the driving force because of the delta P, that is the pressure and then if it is a compressible material, uh, if you remember the very, very early class, you know, where we talked about uh, compressible solids and uh, incompressible solids, we have uh, uh, equation like this, delta P raised to the power S and S we called it as a compressible exponent. So, it is 0 for incompressible, so when you substitute 0 in the incompressible um, the delta P raised to the power 0 becomes 1. So, compressibility will have no effect on the, uh, the flux, whereas um, if the cake is compressible then you put S as 1, then your driving force gets decreased, because if the cake is compressible what will happen? If you put too much driving force or too much pressure, cake will get compressed and uh, the flow rate gets decreased. So, you need to sort of balance between that. So, that is why you will have a term delta P raised to the power S in the <coughs> denominator. In addition, we have terms like uh, V that is the total volume which you want to filter, uh, eta is the viscosity, W is the slurry concentration, alpha is the specific cake resistance. So, this 
I hope uh, you remember uh, the Darcy's equation many 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 classes back we studied and plus you also have Rm resistance offered by the membrane itself. Okay. Unlike a filter cloth membranes may offer resistance to flow because the, um, the pore sizes are very very small that is why. Okay. Now, if uh, resistance offered by the membrane material is very small and then you get a very simple equation that will give you the volume that is getting permeated or that will pass through the membrane area given by this formula. So, this is again like our old filtration equation. This is the governing equation which determines the permeate flow. Now, ultra filtration of course, uh, the pore sizes are very very small and uh, operating pressure is also very high when compared to your the micro <coughs> it is 2 to 10 bar. So, this is uh, the separation based on the molecular size. So, we can use it for separating high molecular weight products into smaller molecular weight products. So, we can use it for separating polymers, proteins, colloids from salts you know ionic salts. So, here the pore size is much smaller than the microfiltration much much smaller that is why you are resorting to higher pressure. Okay. So, when the pore size is very small you, um, you have to go for a higher pressure here osmotic pressure is also negligible because higher molecular weight of solutes that is what we are dealing with actually. Okay. Now, in ultra filtration the flux is based on the concentration polarization. So, there is going to be a concentration um, of the solute build up on the upstream side. So, because of that uh, the flow of the solute is getting disturbed and uh, if you remember a few couple of classes back. I talked about the concentration polarization and an equation for the flux which is given by J the flux is equal to K logarithm C G by C B. C G is the concentration of the solute in the closer to the upstream of the membrane surface or the gel layer. C B is your bulk. So, C G will be much higher than C B because of the build up of solid near the upstream surface of the membrane understand. So, K is your constant. And now, here you see J is independent of the pressure drop. So, the pressure does not come into the picture in ultra filtration whereas, in the micro filtration pressure plays a important role it is almost like a normal filtration you see the difference. Okay. Now, there is going to be rate of loss of solute because solute will always try to escape. Um, now, that will be equal to solute flowing through as permeate. Okay. So, the rate of loss of solute will be d by d t v into c, v is your volume and c is your concentration obvious right. So, we have a negative term because there is going to be decrease anything decrease is that. Now, this is equal to solute flow is j is your flux into area into c p that is concentration of the solute in the permeate. So, this is also obvious understand. So, here you have rate of loss of solute is equal to solute flowing through the system as a permeate. Now, this you write it as the C p you write as C into 1 minus r C is the concentration of the solute in the retentate that is the concentration that is uh, remaining and r is your retention coefficient. So, if the retention coefficient is 0 okay, then C and C p will be the same whereas, if the retention coefficient is 1. So, this will get cancelled off. Okay. So, um, rate of loss of solute on the left hand side solute flowing through as permeate on the right hand side. If the retention coefficient for a solute r is equal to 1 then V c will be a constant you understand. So, if uh, r is equal to 1 this whole term becomes 0. So, d V c by d t equal to 0. So, V c is a constant right. So, a constant volume of a solute will get lost over a whatever time you are talking about, but r is generally 1 less than 1. Okay. So, when, when r is less than 1 now on the left hand side we can differentiate both this separate separately. So, we will have minus c into d v by d t minus v d c by d t which is equal to j c into 1 minus r. Now, d v by d t will be j into a that is the 
j is your flux, a is the area. So, when flux by area is the your rate of flow of liquid correct that is why. So, we can replace this by j a and now v the volume will slowly keep decreasing because of the concentration polarization agreed. So, v i could be your initial volume minus j is your flux into area that is rate into time. So, where it we are considering something like a linear decrease okay. the assumption here is a linear decrease in the amount um, that is flowing through. So, v by v i minus j into t then we can integrate the whole system at t equal to 0 um, c is equal to c i that is initial at t equal to t uh, c is equal to c f understand. So, we can in integrate this uh, all we do is replace this with this term and replace this with this term and then you integrate. So, finally, you may end up like this c f concentration final c i concentration initial v i is your initial retentate volume v f is your in volume then you have the r coming there. So, the amount of solute that is lost v i into c i is initial minus v f into c f final. So, this is the total amount of solute lost in that period of time understood in so much t time. Now, if you want further details you may have to look into this particular references where uh, they have given this derivation and uh, this particular uh, slides are based on those derivation. So, we looked at uh, some of the governing equations in uh, both ultra filtration and micro filtration and, uh, and so we can use those equation to get a feel of uh, what is happening to the process of uh, membrane filtration. Now, let us uh, move forward now in ultra filtration there is a term called nominal molecular weight cutoff NMWCO that means the molecular weight cutoff for which it is designed okay so um, so if this give nmwco as 20000 dalton so it will cut off at that value of 20000 dalton okay so uh, molecular weights bigger than that will be retained molecular weights smaller than that will flow through so if you have a nmwco um, as 10000 molecular weight greater than 10000 will not pass through molecular weight less than 10000 will pass through. So, when you are buying a membrane ultra filtration membrane uh, they give a term called NMWCO. So, it represents the molecular weight for which a rejection coefficient is a fixed percentage that means about 90 percent because we cannot talk 100 percent right that is why we give it as 90 percent. So, the, the molecular weight greater than that NMWCO. Um, will get retained or rejected uh, retained means we talk about 90 percent of it getting rejected okay. So, retained or rejection are the same. So, um, when <coughs> this particular number is characteristic for a ultra filtration membrane okay. Now, let us go to another membrane technology this is a very important uh, membrane process uh, it affects a large percentage of uh, people who are suffering from either kidney damage or inefficient uh, um, kidney system where the urine does not separate out properly uh, from the blood that means the salts in the urine are not separating properly um, or if it is a congenital disease that means um, there are children who are born with this type of problem then uh, they have to resort to hemodialysis and it is quite painful they have to uh, it is not physically painful, but uh, the patients have to undergo this type of treatment every one week or two weeks or and so on actually. That means, the patient every week goes um, and spends about 2-3 hours uh, in and an artificial kidney is uh, attached to him or her and uh, this particular instrument removes all the salts from the blood and makes it normal. And uh, we do not realize our kidney does this job every day day in and day out and um, people who have this problem either should get a kidney transplant and nowadays uh, getting a kidney transplant is uh, impossible because there is a large shortage of uh, kidneys in India itself you know there is a very large shortage and uh, so many of them will not be able to get kidneys number one. Number two sometimes the kidney can uh, body can reject the kidney 
you may have a kidney transplant, but the body can reject the kidney and then it becomes totally useless. So, generally a kidney transplant within a relationship is always favorable because the rejection ratios are much much low. Okay. So, if uh, somebody who cannot get a kidney transplant and who has a problem in uh, getting the salts in the blood like uric acid and other salts, they may have to undergo this particular uh, hemodialysis. So, what is a hemodialysis? So, there is a membrane, it is a long tube fibrous membrane and then you have something called a dialysate that is a fresh dialysate, nothing it is nothing but salts and water that is all. Okay. So, it is flowing and uh, some it is flowing because you apply some air pressure. Now, the blood from the artery comes that means uh, from the patient it goes through this particular fibrous membrane. So, all the salts gets diffused and they go to the dialysate and the blood that is leaving will be free from all these salts. So, this is called the used dialysate which will have all the salts toxic salts present in the blood. So, that is why this is called a artificial kidney. So, it is a fibrous long tube here you introduce fresh dialysate and here what you get is a used dialysate. Okay. So, uh, it needs to be processed so that it gets co converted into fresh dialysate. So, whatever uh, toxic salts that are there uh, which it has taken from the blood will be removed and then again it is put back. So, this is a it looks very very simple, but it saves <coughs> thousands and thousands of uh, um, patients who have problem with the kidney. <coughs> Let us look at what it does. So, it is um, uh, hemodialysis is a dialysis unit in the medical field. So, we can use it even uh, um, in uh, your uh, manufacturing process where you are interested in separating out certain um, salts from certain solutions. It can even be used for separation of alcohol from beer and so on. So, what is it doing? The blood is drawn from the patient passed through the lumen of a hollow fiber unit. Okay. There is a long uh, hollow fiber. Uh, water containing solutes that is called the dialysate such as potassium salts pass through the outer side that is the shell side. Now, why do you add salts to the water? So, that it will also have same osmotic pressure as the blood otherwise what will happen if there is an osmotic pressure water will start flowing into the blood you do not want that to happen understand that is why you do not just pass water in the outer side of the fibrous membrane you also have salts. So, that the osmotic pressure is balanced and there is no water ingress into the blood. Okay. So, what happens when um, these two liquids flow urea, uric acid, creatine, phosphates, chlorides diffuse from the blood into water and your blood gets purified. Looks quite simple, but it does a fantastic job. So, you can the separation of solutes generally happen because of diffusion across the membrane from one liquid phase to another. So, it is based on the concentration difference. So, the uh, the blood has a very high concentration of all these salts and your dialysis has a very low concentration of this. So, the drying force is your concentration difference. So, the dialysis membrane it does not have porous no, it does not have non porous characteristics like RO or micro porous characteristic of UF. Okay. So, it is in between both it is not completely non porous like uh, reverse osmosis or it is not uh, it is got so many pores like ultra filtration. So, it is in between. So, the process is very slow normally the patients uh, who go for uh, this type of dialysis treatment have to spend 4 to 6 hours. So, it is a very very long process. So, if uh, somebody has to do dialysis every month imagine the person has to spend more than half a day um, lying down a dialysis machine connected to the person. So, if it can be speeded up then uh, people will be very very happy actually. So, there is a lot of research opportunities uh, in trying to speed up this uh, dialysis process also. 
So, how is how can one speed up? One way is to increase the surface area, but you cannot increase the contact area uh, too much because the flow gets disturbed. Okay. So, what happens? There is a solute flux J which is equal to R, R is a resistance, delta C is your driving force, obvious, right. Now, the resistance or manifold resistance because of the membrane itself, resistance because of the film on the blood side, resistance because of the dialysate salts on the other side, agreed. So, there are three resistances you need to consider, R is made up of three resistance. So, the blood is flowing, dialysate is also flowing, although I have shown it as counter current generally co current is preferred. So, if you have the dialysis membrane, there is going to be a film in the blood side and there is going to be another film in the dialysate side. So, the salts have to diffuse through these three films, the film which is formed by the salts in the blood side and the film that is formed on the dialysate side and in between you also have the membrane material. Okay. So, the equation for the flux is given by this resistance multiplied by delta C, delta C is your drying force concentration gradient. Okay. Now, there is something called dialyzer clearance that means, it tells you how much the rate of removal of a substance from the blood. Okay. When you say rate of removal, we will say there is always a time per minute or pi per second per hour. So, it depends on many factors, characteristics of the dialyzer, nature of the treatment and so on. So, if you look at the mass balance for your particular solutes C, you have K D okay, that is your clearance C i, okay, that is the amount of solute that is removed that is equal to q i into c i, q i is the input blood flow that is at the inlet, q naught is the outlet blood flow from the dialyzer, agreed? Obvious, c i is your concentration of the solute in, c naught is the concentration out, obvious. So, you have concentration of solutes coming in into q and again you have a concentration of solute leaving into Q, this is equal to amount removed K D into C i. Okay. Generally C naught will be much much smaller than C i, because in your dialyzer the main goal is to remove the salts. So, obviously Q naught has to be very small, no problem. right? So, we can combine these equation. If Q f is the ultra filtration rate, that is some blood flow also happens that means, blood escapes through the membrane and reaches your dialysate. So, then q i that is the amount of blood coming in will be equal to q naught plus q f. You do not want blood escaping into the dialysate, right? but it can happen in some situations. So, do not forget that it can happen. Uh, in generally, we can assume some number. So, we can substitute all these and we get an equation for k d that is the clearance. What is k d? Dialyser clearance removal rate of a substance from blood that is given by q i that is the blood flow into the dialyzer. Okay. Q naught is the blood flow out leaving, q f is the blood escaping through the dialyzer, c naught is the concentration of the salts entering your dialyzer, okay. c i is your concentration entering, c naught is what is going out. Um, generally, q f is equal to 0, generally blood will not escape and then generally uh, all these quantities are same that means, q f will be equal to q f and so on actually. right? So, a very simple equation uh, comes out the clearance k d is given by q b that is the amount of blood rate of blood flowing through the dialyzer 1 minus C naught by C i. C i is the inlet concentration of the solute, C naught is the concentration of the solute leaving the dialyzer and generally C naught is greater than C i or less than C i. C naught will be 
less than C A very very small because we are trying to remove the salts right. So, C naught will be less than C I agreed. So, this gives you an idea about the clearance. Okay. Now, solvent flow across the membrane also occurs in dialysis because of osmotic pressure difference. Okay. So, there is some osmotic pressure. So, there is some loss of uh, water and water may enter into your blood and so on. Okay. And generally we use a co-current type of uh, flow to avoid a pressure drop across the membrane. So, these are some points which one needs to think about in the case of a dialysis. Now, let us go to something called electrodialysis. Electrodialysis as the name implies electro, we apply a very large potential difference. So, when you apply a large potential difference cations will go to where cathode anions go to the anode okay, and uh, they get separated out because of the large electric flow. And we have cation favoring uh, membranes, anion favoring membranes or selective cation selective membranes, anion selective membranes. So, in an electrodialysis you have many chambers or many compartments and each chamber is separated by one set of membranes. Okay. They are called ion selective membranes. So, you may have cation selective membranes, then you may have anion selective membranes, you have again cation selective and so on actually. And then you are applying a very large voltage you see anode, you see cathode here. Now, imagine I have a protein and a salt solution. When do you have a protein and a salt solution? Especially if you are doing salting out. When you do salt out, you add lot of ammonium sulphate. So, your protein solution will also have salt solution. So, first step is to remove all the salt. So, electrodialysis is very good because salt is ammonium sulphate, it will nicely ionize and I can put a large voltage and I will be able to separate them out. That is the whole idea. Um, so, that protein can be recovered in water. Now, suppose I have a protein in salt solution and then I am passing water. So, water is passed into alternate chambers, protein is passed into alternate chambers. Now, you are applying a very very large voltage and then you have uh, anion selective membranes, cation selective membranes alternatively. What will happen? Look here. Now, you are salt gets ionized agreed. So, the pluses want to go there. So, if it is a cation selective membrane it will nicely go there. Now, imagine a minus will not be able to go there. Okay. So, minus has to who which wants to go to the anode and this is an anion selective membrane. So, the minus will go here. Okay. Now, this plus wants to go there, but it cannot go because there is a and an selective membrane. So, it will st stick here. So, what will happen? You have alternate chambers with plus and minus and the alternate chambers will be pure free from salt. So, you will have alternate chambers without any salt and alternate chambers with high concentration of salt. So, what will happen? You will have protein in water in alternate chambers, it will be free of salt and uh, you will have high concentration of salts in the alternate chamber understood. Okay. So, I can nicely recover my protein from the alternate chamber which is in water medium and the, all the salts would have gone to the alternate chambers. This is the uh, how system by which electrodialysis does its job very interesting. They have got lot of advantages disadvantages it is very good for doing this, but uh, there is heat generation um, because you are applying high voltage energy consumption is very high uh, membrane uh, material you need to replace from time to time because of fouling and so on actually you know there are different types of fouling happening here erosion of the uh, membrane may surface all these happens actually. But it is uh, it is a good system to have because uh, you will have alternate chambers without any salt that means pure water and alternate chambers you will have very highly concentrated salt 
present actually. So, that is the advantage of this type of uh, electrodialysis. Okay. Now, we can use it for desalination of brackish water. So, what you can do is um, we can uh, use electrodialysis all the slurry uh, of salts will be in the alternate chambers and uh, remaining alternate chambers will be free of uh, the salt and so we will get drinking water. Separation of ions occur due to the potential difference across the and selective cationic and anionic and exchange membranes as I mentioned actually. So, it will have a stack of compartments sometimes you will have 20, 30 stacks actually and each stack uh, will have alternating membranes like cationic, anionic, cationic, anionic and so on actually. So, the drying force here is what there is an applied electric field. Now, this induces a current and there is a flux across the compartments. This is what happens in an electrodialysis. So, positively charged species goes through the cationic membrane, negatively charged species go through the anionic membrane uh, because these membranes are very selective. So, this other type of charged material will not go to the um, non-selective membrane. So, we can use it for selective separation of mixtures of ionic species depends on the difference in ionic mobilities also. So, some smaller ions may be able to go diffuse much faster. So, they are much more mobile larger ions um, will take much longer time. So, we can use it as a, a function of uh, mobility as well. So, the effluence that means the liquid that is coming out of uh, alternate compartments will be concentrated of the ionic species and depleted of ion species. So, you will have concentrated, depleted, concentrated, depleted and so on actually. So, that is the advantage of uh, this particular setup. So, there is a mathematical relation which connects the current that is flowing with the, the charge particle details you know. So, you have current I is equal to this is a constant it is called Faraday's constant, N is the solution normality, Q is your flow rate, eta is, is your uh, efficiency, N is your number of cells, E is your current efficiency. So, eta is a removal efficiency E is your current efficiency do not forget. Now, F is the Faraday constant. So, this is the normal number for the Faraday constant. Okay. Now, using this equation I can calculate if I know the flow rate, if I know efficiency factors little bit here um, if like this efficiency and this efficiency okay, um, and N gives you number of cells. Um, so, if I know all these I may be able to calculate what will be I that means what will be the current. Now, there is another term which is very important that is called the electrodialysis power that means how much power should I put in for this particular operation. So, if I calculate uh, my current from this equation I can substitute here and if I know the resistance of the entire op setup of n cells that means n compartments and I say cells it is n compartments I will be able to calculate the power. So, it will give me an idea of the power requirements for performing an electrodialysis type of uh, operation. There is another equation um, which also gives you a flavor of uh, the process that is taking place that is called the Stephen Maxwell theory. So, that gives you a force on each charge component when it is uh, present in an n component mixture. Okay. So, we have uh, it is a summation because when you have n component mixture each component will undergo or experience a force because of another component that is why you have summation here we have C i C j. Okay. C j will be running from 1 to n small n where small n is the number of components okay. uh, d i j is a Stephen Maxwell diffusivity okay. So, left hand side is all the driving forces exerted on a species okay. right hand side is related to all the friction forces actually. Okay. Now, um, you have the concentration C t is your total concentration P is the pressure 
r is your universal gas constant, t is your time and so on actually. Okay. So, this tells you what is the force that a particle of certain charge uh, experiences in the presence of many particles that is n particles. We will not go too much into that that is uh, too much of a fundamental study. Um, whereas, uh, this equation may be much more useful which gives you an idea about the amount of current um, when you have n compartments, when you know the efficiency of the removal uh, process, when you know the efficiency of the current, when you know the solution normality and when you know the flow rate. Okay. This equation is much more useful and of course, this gives you an idea about the power. So, this equation is also pretty equal, useful. Now, based on uh, this equation let us look at a problem. So, I have an electrodialysis unit, this is used to remove 2.2 moles of ammonium sulphate from a dilute solution of protein. So, you are passing a current of 176 ampere, how far should the feed be introduced into the compartment to remove 99.9 percent of the salt. Okay. So, I want to remove 99.9 percent of the salt, I want to know Q and uh, the amount of salt solution that is flowing in contains 2.2 molar ammonium sulphate and I am passing 176 amps. Okay. So, how do you solve this? So, we know 1 amp is equal to 1 coulomb and 96487 coulombs is 1 mole of electron. Okay. If I take 1 mole of ammonium sulphate there will be 2 moles of electrons right 2. SO4 double minus. So, you will have 2 electrons. So, all you need to do is uh, substitute them into this and then you will be able to get the value for Q. Now, Q is Q into 0.99 is the amount of uh, um, salt that are removing. Okay. So, from there we will be able to calculate Q understand. So, the problem is I have so much so many molars of salt solution flowing at a particular rate and I want to remove so much of the salt from a solution, I am passing so much current. So, what should be my flow of the solution? Okay. So, this comes from the um, ionization of the salt, in this particular case ammonium sulphate NH4 2 SO4. So, there will be 2 electron flowing into that, whereas if it is sodium chloride it will be 1 electron flowing into that. Okay. So, do not forget that. So, that is how you calculate the whole problem. Now, let us go to a, a, um, again a process which makes use of a, a voltage that is the electrophoresis. We all have come across this uh, in analytical lab where you want to separate proteins of different charges. Okay. So, all proteins have some charge why there are nitrogens and COOH what is COOH? That is the acidic group. So, there is going to be COO minus that is a charge, sometimes nitrogen will have N plus, so that is a charge. So, proteins will always have charges, do not forget that. Okay. So, there is one pH at which proteins will have net 0 charge and that is called the isoelectric point. So, if we are operating away from isoelectric point, proteins will have charge. So, if I apply a voltage, okay, proteins will start moving. So, if I have proteins of different molecular weight or different sizes and uh, they are all plus, I am applying a large voltage, they will all get attracted to the negative minus correct cathode. Now, the speed at which they get attracted will depend upon the mobility that means, it will depend upon the size. So, I can achieve a separation based on the size, okay. this is how electrophoresis work, you agree. Now, if you neglect gravitational forces, the force on the charged protein will depend on the electrical potential that means, how much potential I am applying and the mobility divided by delta x, delta x is the distance between the two electrodes. So, if the delta x is very very large the the mobility the rate the speed at which the protein or the velocity at which the protein is moving will get decreased. If my electrical potential 
is large, the speed at which the protein is moving will be high and if the mobility is very large then the speed at which the protein is moving also will be very high. Now, this mobility is again dependent on several, several factors d the diffusion coefficient, z charge on the protein, f is your Faraday constant or t universal constant and t is thermal. So, you see here the mobility you can see is a function of diffusion coefficient, mobility is a function of a charge. So, if I have very large uh, charged protein it will move very fast towards the cathode if the charge is very low it will move slowly. So, if I have a protein with charge 2 minus uh, plus 2 and if I have protein with plus 1 charge the plus 2 charged protein will move faster right than the plus 1 charged protein ok. And, but of course, you have something called diffusion coefficient. If the diffusion coefficients are different between the proteins then that will also affect the mobility. So, only not only the charge on the protein that is an important, but also the diffusion coefficient. So, sometimes if you have a very large protein the diffusion coefficient may be very poor, then the movement will be retarded that means, it will be moving much slowly. Whereas, if you have a protein which is uh, much smaller then uh, it will be moving much faster that means, the diffusion coefficient will be much larger then the mobility also will be larger. So, the size of the protein matters, the um, charge on the protein matters. So, both matters actually understand. So, you look at mobility you have for albumin 5.9 gamma globin 1 that means, it is almost 6 times slower fibrinogen minus 2.1 that means, albumin is 3 times or 2 times faster than fibrinogen and fibrinogen is about 2 times faster than globin ok. So, you see large difference in the protein mobility ok. Let us uh, look at a small problem using uh, this approach. I have two enzymes A and B to be separated by a gel electrophoresis. Generally, we use this particular approach electrophoresis um, for separating protein. I am doing it at 4 degree centigrade. Now, the diffusion coefficient of protein or enzyme A is this much the diffusion coefficient of enzyme B is this much that means, this has got a higher diffusion coefficient than this. Now, this has got higher charge see this has got 7 this has got only 1 ok. So, because of charge this protein may move faster, but because of diffusion coefficient this protein will move faster. So, this is the equation the velocity diffusion coefficient the charge Faraday constant divided by r into t. Now, we are applying a field of 1.8 volt per centimeter, how long it will take to separate them by a distance of 2 centimeter. So, how long it will take? So, that they are 2 centimeters away. So, now I can calculate velocity a, I know d a, I know z a charge, I know Faraday constant, I know r t. So, I can get v a agreed. So, for v b you have d b, z b, f r t. So, I get v b. Now, this protein is going at a velocity of 6.1 into 10 power 5 minus 5 centimeter per second. This protein is going at 2.4 10 power minus 5 per second. Um, so, velocity a minus velocity b into time will be equal to distance correct. Velocity into time is distance agreed. So, v a minus v b into time will give me distance. Distance is 2 centimeter. I want to push them 2 centimeter apart. Now, V a is this much, V b is this much. So, time comes out to be 15 hours. So, I run this electrophoresis for 15 hours, so that the two proteins get separated by 2 centimeter based on the protein charge based on the diffusion coefficient of the protein correct. Now, the this is how you use to calculate how long should I apply this particular electric field. So, that the proteins get separated by say 1 centimeter or 2 centimeter or 3 centimeter and so on actually ok. So, this problem very simple problem tells you um, in the electrophoresis system how do you separate out proteins ok. Now, 
the simple equation. So, you have velocity, we have the mobility, we have the, um, the electric potential or the force we apply divided by the delta x. Such a simple equation we make use of and uh, calculate what should be the time required to separate these two proteins by 2 centimeter apart. Okay. Now, let us look at uh, another membrane separation process that is called perv operation. It is a combination of permeation and evaporation. So, we can separate two or more components with the help of a very thin perv operation membrane. So, if one component has certain rate of diffusion, another component has another rate of diffusion, these two can be separated. Perv operation is not based on filtration because there are no holes in the membrane. The solute gets sort of dissolved inside the membrane, it gets diffused and it comes on the other side. So, you have a vapor on one side, how do you achieve vaporization? You heat it up. Okay? So, there is going to be a vapor on one side, then that solute gets dissolved in the membrane, it travels through the membrane and then on the other side it is collected and it becomes a liquid. So, what is the driving force? You apply a vacuum on the other side. So, you have a um, heating on one side and you have a vacuum on the other side and the membrane does not have any pores or holes. This is what perv operation is. It is a combination of permeation and evaporation. Okay, how does the setup look like? Simple one, very simple. You have a perv operation membrane, you have your feed, you heat up the feed so that it gets vaporized. So, it comes here and you are applying a vacuum on the other side. So, that is the driving force. So, the vapor gets dissolved in the membrane material, it travels or diffuses through and the vapor comes out on the other side, it is condensed in a condenser and you collect the liquid. So, here you are applying a heating so that the feed gets vaporized, here you are condensing the vapor and the driving force is your vacuum here. And there are no pores in the membrane, so the process is permeation and evaporation. So, permeation is like a diffusion, it is not like a filtration here. So, you have a hydrophilic membranes, hydrophobic membranes that is membranes which favor a particular type of material. If you want to recover only hydrophilic uh, uh, solutes, then you go for hydrophilic membranes. If you want to recover hydrophobic materials, then you have a hydrophobic membrane. So, if you have a hydrophilic membranes here, hydrophilic material will permeate through or diffuse through. If you have a hydrophobic membrane, you will have a um, hydrophobic material will permeate or diffuse through. So, that is the difference. So, this process is very good, it is being used quite a lot for concentrating fruit juices or um, dairy products, it can be used for separating water from uh, alcohol. So, we can get 100 percent alcohol here. So, the membrane will pass only water through and as you know um, we cannot get 100 percent water by dif uh, distillation because water forms a azeotrope and distillation is not possible. So, in such situations we use perv operation. If you have fruit juices and I want to remove some water, I cannot heat it up because fruit juice will get uh, totally charred or burnt. So, here you will have a hydrophilic membrane and uh, only water will go away. So, this side you will get more concentrated fruit juice. So, this process is already being commercially practiced in many places, especially for food as well as for concentrating as well as for uh, uh, water removal um, as so on actually. So, we shall continue more on this uh, perv operation process uh, in the next class.